irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza and Matt Polachek, only on LA Talk Radio. Welcome to another edition of Answers for the Family. I am your guest host today, Joelle Jacobson. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in private practice and clinical outreach manager for Hazelden Betty Ford. Dr. Matt Polachek is unable to be with us today, but will be back next week. And Alan Cardoza is in Bucharest, Romania right now. And fortunately, he was able to hop on the call to join us for this segment today for Answers for the Family. And knowing who our guests will be today, I know it's going to be a great show and one you won't want to miss. Every Monday from 11 a.m. to noon Pacific Time, this show will bring you special guests that can inspire, educate, and entertain, while bringing answers and options to raising children today and generations to follow. This show will address issues such as locating your runaway teen, family crisis intervention, building self-esteem, dealing with addictions, and so much more. We will introduce you to talented authors and new innovations in the areas of health, security, and fun for your family. Alan, do you want to say a quick hello? Hello, everybody, and greetings from Bucharest, Romania. And what are you doing in Bucharest? I am here on uh, multiple reasons, uh, one of which is that Uh, It's the World Association of Detectives Conference where uh, a couple hundred of us from around the world meet and discuss the ways in which we do our job in our countries. We discuss how we can help each other to provide our service better uh, and and help the world. Uh, It's it's a great group. It's a great organization. It's our 92nd year, I believe, uh, our 92nd annual conference. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm also doing a little training. I'm meeting with local law enforcement uh, to help them. And earlier today, I toured Castle Film Studios uh, to, to look at some of the studios and how they shoot movies out here. Uh, yesterday, I went to uh, <laughs> Transylvania and visited uh, the Dracula ca- uh, castle. So it's been quite an interesting time out here. <laughs> well, that sounds great. And you're doing such wonderful work and educating people across the globe. Um, so wanted to introduce today's show topic. We will be discussing residential treatment from a student's perspective. And we have the honor of having two graduates from Heritage, uh, Heritage School. Uh, just as a way of background, uh, we have two students, and we also have the therapist, Elena Chatterley, who was with, with us um, some time ago discussing heritage as well. Uh, Elena first worked with teens as a trail walker for a wilderness program in Arizona. She enjoyed the intense connections made with these students and enjoyed the natural consequences that spoke much louder than any therapy could. Shortly after that, she completed a master's degree in 2005. She joined Heritage, continuing her emphasis on natural consequences and self-directed change. She has also worked in substance abuse recovery, outpatient, individual, and couples counseling, and outpatient children's play therapy. Elena says teens and residential treatment have been far my favorite with the most successful outcomes. Elena believes the long-term nature of heritage provides an ideal environment for genuine internal change for teens. They can't fake it and instead have to tap deep within themselves for change that lasts, which means so much more for success after they leave heritage. So we have the honor of having two alum from heritage, uh, Damon and Liz. Um, So just a little background on Liz. She went to Heritage when she was 15 years old and attended the program for almost two years. Before Heritage, Liz struggled with depression, dishonesty, challenges in family relationships, friendships, and her academics. 
She was acting out at that time and didn't know how to cope with her depression. Her parents were very concerned about her and her future, so they looked into Heritage for help and uh, for support. Elizabeth is currently in college now, working toward her BA in sociology. She was working at an advertising agency and will be starting a new position as a recruiting coordinator position to eventually become a recruiter. Damon is a middle child. His hobbies are spending time with friends and family and playing football. His goals are to play football at BYU, get a PhD in psychology, and to become a sports psychologist. Damon also wants to show children who are going through challenges in their life that help is attainable if you're open to receiving it. Surrounding yourself with positive influences and people who support you will keep you on a healthy track. So Elizabeth and Damon share their stories about what led them to treatment, what the experience was like for them, and did it help? So I will be asking them some questions and they will be sharing some of their stories and experiences of what it was like being there. And uh, as I'd mentioned, also joining us here today is Elena Chatterley, who is an LCSW and uh, at Heritage School. So, Damon, what feelings did you have toward your parents at the beginning when they first told you that they wanted to put you into uh, the program at Heritage? At first I had a lot of hatred, but as time passed I understood that I needed help. Nothing was going right in my life and as I got along with treatment and ex finally accepted it, I realized that my parents were great and I thanked them for it. So that's that's a really wonderful answer. I'm sure a lot of parents appreciate your answer, knowing that their children won't um, hold this against them, that once they start to see that they really do need help, that their relationship will start to repair through the treatment. So Liz, what did you think when you arrived at Heritage? So I think I had kind of a different um, initial reaction. Um, I wasn't upset. Uh, if anything, I was really excited. I wanted to get away from my parents, and I thought um, because it was my first placement, I didn't really know what to expect, so I thought it was going to be like college, and I was going to be living with friends, and really it was just an escape from them. I didn't understand all of the therapeutical aspects of a residential facility. Um, so when I first arrived, I was a little confused about all of the rules, but uh, quickly figured out that it was not like college in some ways, um, and um, was able to adjust pretty quickly. And you saw the need for the structure? I did, yes. Um, I was put, when I first arrived there, I was put into a low stimulus unit, which I think they then figured out I should switch to a different uh, area and it was definitely a lot different than the home I was on in the end but I I'm so sorry I think I just went off track <laughs> no that's okay um, I definitely understood the structure and I think it was very necessary thank you Elena what kind of treatment modalities do you use at Heritage well, our campus is divided into two main programs. That's a little bit different than since Liz was there, because Liz was there a few years ago. But currently, we treat students on the autism spectrum, and we use a program called PEERS that is one of the evidence-based programs out of UCLA to help treat um, our autism students with their comorbid diagnoses, you know, depression. We use all, all the same mental health treatments that others would use in addition to teaching social skills. Now the other side of our campus is called Elevate, and there we treat trauma and mood disorders and oppositional and defiant disorders. And from there, you know, we run the gamut from EMDR to just straight cognitive behavioral therapy. We're very relationship-based and emphasize what a student needs most to change. And what kind of um, family therapy do you do? And how do you handle um, when the parents don't live in, in the state? Okay, most of our students are not in Utah, where we're based. And so we do family therapy via Skype or FaceTime. Uh, it really helps to have that video contact. And we do it once a week for an hour. So it's weekly family therapy in addition to their weekly individual therapy. Some families we do speakerphone because we might be conferencing like dad in from work and mom in from somewhere else, but oftentimes we get everybody on Skype and that's really helpful. That's great. 
Now, I, if I can interject, I've got a question for Damon. Uh, Damon, you mentioned that you were very upset uh, in the very beginning uh, with your parents. Um, uh, how did you get to the program? Were you transported? Yeah, I was transported from another placement that I was at, and the guy was actually rather nice. He was a really big, okay. scary guy, but when I got there, I was kind of like, oh, I really don't like this place. It's going to be another placement for me, and then and I just met some of the people that I met some of the staff and realized that the staff truly cared and I loved it. You know, and one of the things, and I thank you so much for your candor and, and both of you, um, you know, I believe that you're doing so much good for so many people because this is a scary thing for parents. And so many times when we're talking to the parents ahead of time and the parents will say, you know, my child's going to hate this or my child's going to hate me or at times in which we are doing doing the transport, the child will say in the front of the parents, you know, I, I hate you for this. So so the fact that you can talk about the fact that you had those feelings in the beginning, but that you understood afterwards and that you recognized how important it was and that you can now value it, I think is huge for so many parents out there to hear. Liz, what do you think about what Alan just said? I had a lot of friends that were transported and I keep in touch with a lot of people from Heritage and it's been a couple of years but we still talk about how we definitely understand that we needed to go and all of the negative feelings we had towards our parents at any point in the program, not just when we got there, but there, it's just completely changed. We thank them for what they've done for us and I don't know anyone that still hates their parents for sending them there. No one, it's not easy for the parents. like. I remember I turned around and looked at my mom and she just was crying and I thought like how could I ever think this was easy for her or that she's enjoying this. Wow that is really um, <clears throat> very sweet of you to say because um, since no one's sitting with us in the room right now we're all tearing up um, because for a child to really see um, how difficult this decision is for their parents um, is, shows a lot about, I'm sure, how you've grown um, and just really will help so many parents out there with their decision to pursue treatment. Do you feel that, um, Damon, do you feel if you went to just weekly individual therapy that you would have garnered the results that you see and, and the growth? No, not only was it just therapy that helped me, it was also the students and the staff. Like, there's been multiple staff that will literally care about you so much to where when you're hurting, they're hurting. I, there was a time where I was not able to go to my brother's graduation, and it hurt me a lot. And there was a staff that was sitting there processing with me, and they started to cry because they felt the pain that I was feeling. And it's just like, when you have so many people that care about you, so many people that want to see you succeed, it's, it's way different from just going in hey, I'm feeling a little upset, so, oh, okay, therapy's over for the week. All right. Yeah, so it sounds like being in an environment, a real treatment setting with multiple support really helped you as, as opposed to weekly therapy may not have been as effective, and I'm sure for a lot of people it is the same. Well, I'd like to add to that. As a therapist, having worked in outpatient settings and the inpatient, this long-term residential, um, it's really easy one hour a week or even two hours a week in therapy for a student to say or do things that aren't representative of what is happening in real life. Liz is over here nodding because I know a little bit about her background and the same thing I'm sure happened for her. But to have the ability for me as a therapist to know what's happening day by day, week by week with these students, to get to talk to their staff, to talk to their friends, I have this comprehensive view of what is truly going on in the patterns for this student. And being able to address that, and a student can't sort of BS me, I can say, well, let's bring in your favorite staff and talk about how you acted over the weekend, or let's talk about what's really happening when such and such goes on. It's really powerful. So there, therefore, change happens in a way it never could in an outpatient setting. That's a, that's a great, great point. Um, Liz, what do you think one of the most important um, coping skills were that you learned at Heritage? I'd say journaling. I never journaled before I went to Heritage, and by the time I left, I probably had about four journals that were just completely filled, um, not just with writing, but also with drawings and um, magazine clippings and quotes. 
Um, and that it, there was like a situation I remember that happened like during PE and I was so frustrated by it and I wrote the whole situation out and by the end I read it and I thought I cannot believe I was even upset about that that seems so silly I'm so embarrassed but I felt so much better and without that journal I would not have processed that Damon what do you think I can agree with the journaling like there is a certain staff that brought me a journal and it goes back to how staff care about you. He wrote, I was like one of his sons. And when I wrote in that journal, I'd always look up at the very beginning. If I, was very, if I was feeling very depressed, feeling very sad or mad as can be at the world because my shoe wasn't tied right. I was like, you know what? This is horrible. I looked at the beginning of what he wrote and it helped me out. And then I journal, I write it down and I'd look at myself up like, really? You tied your own shoe. You didn't tie it tight enough. So you're mad at the world for it. That's your fault. And it's just like, you look at the situations, and I just make light of when I was mad for no reason. I'd laugh at it, like, that was that was pretty bad. It's kind of your fault for not tying your shoe tight. Like, you can't be mad at the world. Like, they didn't tie it for you. And when I look at it, like, even to this day, there's sometimes where I laugh to the point to where I start to cry because I look at how ridiculous some situations were, and I see how funny it was that I was mad for no reason. But Damon, it, it sounds like one of the things that, that you feel that you got or one of the, the best advantages that you got is the fact that you understand about taking responsibility, that that became a huge part of what you learned there and that you now see it in other people when they do or don't do the same. Is that correct? Yes, sir, it is. Um, I just want to ask, because we sort of glossed over, and maybe Damon didn't get to answer for why he came here. I'm sure we have listeners who are curious what it is that Damon had to overcome or what led up to his being placed at Heritage. That's a great point. <clears throat> the reason why I was sent to Heritage is because I basically threatened my parents. I'd act out, and I'd just do whatever I wanted. I would not listen to them. I had horrible grades. I'd lie about my grades. I'd lie about homework. Or even worse, I would do my homework and I'd lose it. Or do my homework and not write my name on it. And then when I get under the heat, I try and divert the situation. And my parents just finally had enough of it because, you know what, we cannot let you live your life like this because what are you going to tell your boss? You need help. You need to see somebody about your anger because it's, it's becoming too much. And it got to the point to where my parents decided, you know, you're going to one place. I acted up there. And that place was like, you know what, I cannot handle this kid anymore. He is acting up too much, and it's just too much for us. It's too much for everybody. It's just threatening the kids. I want the heritage. Mm -hmm. And now I can say I'm a completely changed person, thanks to Elena and all the staff that were there with me. Now, Damon, you, you said that you diverted when talking about um, how you were acting out. You said that you diverted. Can you share with everybody a little bit about how you diverted then and then now that uh, you have graduated from Heritage, when there is a situation like that, how do you handle it differently? Back then, it could be, did you do your homework? Well, why are you yelling at me for not doing my homework when dad didn't do his homework? Your dad's not in school, Damon. Well, dad's not doing this, dad's not doing that, so why do I have to do it, but you're not him? And now, Damon, why don't you do your homework? To be dead honest, I was being lazy. I don't want to do it, and that's my fault, and I'll do it as quick as possible. Even if I don't get a grade for it, I'll still do it. It's just the whole principle of doing what you're told when you're told. And if I want to get into BYU, they got a pretty, it's a pretty hard school to get in, so I just do my homework now and look at, like, the light that it brings because my parents let me do a lot of fun things with my friends. Nothing stupid, but they let me have fun in an appropriate manner. Oh, that's a really nice answer. Um, so how was it when you left Heritage and you went back home? How was it acclimating back to being at home? It was actually really fun. I'm not going to lie. I, I did cry a lot. I cried a whole bunch. Because as much as people say, I hate treatment, you say that while you're there. You say it before. But once you're there and you leave, you realize how much fun you had and I just had to take the, because it hurt me a lot. I was very depressed, and I had to think about, hey, these are the tools that I learned. These are the people that I want to be able to see. Let me just have some fun while I'm home. Let me do what I need to do. And luckily, luckily enough for me, I came home at the very beginning of football season, and I love football. That's my life. So I was like, you know what? It's football season. Let me have some fun. 
you know, I tried my best in football. I have a starting spot at left tackle for my high school. And it's just the tools that I have to learn and getting reacclimated back at home is just have fun, do what I need to do, live your life to the fullest. That's great. How about you, Liz? Yeah, just to add on that, um, when I left, we had, I believe it was called an after-treatment home care plan or something. Yeah, the home treatment plan. Yeah, something like that. And it had kind of a predetermined set of guidelines that you were going to follow and things that you had agreed upon with your family, um, things that you were expected to do. It really went into everything, like schooling and dating and friends and how much time you were going to be on the computer just so that everything was covered because when you go from a place with a ton of structure where you really can't mess up too much because someone's always watching to the real world where your parents are at work all day you really need something to be guiding you along Um, and so that treatment plan the home treatment plan was very very important and I think I followed it for the most part in the beginning, but got a little excited by all of the freedom that I had. Um, I also did a lot of crying. As excited as I was to be home, I would watch my graduation video like maybe twice a week and just cry because I knew that I was never going to be living with 12 girls ever again and have the best therapist in the world. And to this day, I can tell you I've had about three therapists after Heritage, and I have never had a therapist as great as Eugene at Heritage. So if you go to Heritage, try and get Eugene. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's very nice. Um, Right, so so the closeness that you get when you are, you know, emotionally raw is very different than you just being at school with 12 of your best friends and at lunch and nutrition every day. It's a very different experience. You're going through that growth. Well, I know I already talked about this, but to reemphasize the um, influence that peers have on each other in that program, like we talked about the therapy aspect of being there 24-7, but therapy itself is actually happening constantly because you're hearing what your friend did in session and you're having group therapies and talking about it later with your friends when you fall asleep or seeing other people's consequences and getting support from people who are trying to change too. So that's, I I like that both of these students have talked about how important their friends were and how much they missed it because those friends and those peer influences are a big part of change too. And so what you learned at Heritage, how have you been able to maintain the changes in in behavior or did you ever slip back into your old um old kind of old habits damon the way i was able to like hold on to it was whenever i see i get myself frustrated i just think about all the times that i get frustrated at heritage and what would i do people say what would jesus do what would the old damon do while he was at heritage (laughs) <laughs> and, well, I did slip up once. I got mad. I think it was because I had to work out and I had a hurt knee. And I didn't have to work out. I just put it in my head I had to work out because I wanted to work out. Uh, it made no sense to me. I was like, you don't have to work out, but you want to, but you don't have to, all right? Anyway, I got mad, and me and my parents got into an argument. And then I had to just think, what would the old Damon do while he was at Heritage? I can't put that in letters because that's too long, but what would I do? I just sat there. I was like, you know what? If I was arguing with my parents on the phone, I'd take a step back. Be like, you know what? I'm not feeling it right now. Can we talk about this later? Let me just get some time to think. That's great. That's a really great coping skill. And Liz? Um, I think the most important thing I learned at Heritage that I kind of took into um, my life when I came home was... When you're wrong about something or you've lied, just it's always easier to just admit that you have lied or that you were wrong and nobody is going to be upset with you about that. I mean, for the most part, but it's always better to tell the truth. So I think when I got home, um, I definitely struggled with honesty sometimes, but in the end, I just had to say, you know what, I was wrong or I lied and nobody died. You know, it was it was okay, and I still use that every day. Um, and people respect you if you admit, like, hey, I was wrong about that. I'm so sorry you were right. People respect you so much more, and I think that's really, really important to take. To take responsibility. Yeah, just take responsibility mm-hmm. for your actions. And it's easier said than done because, you know, everyone is pretty prideful. And 
Well, both of you had a lot of time to practice that at Heritage. Both of you were <laughs> there for our average stay or a little bit longer, which I think really shows in how well you've maintained your changes coming home. I just emphasize that. Sometimes parents are sending their kids away and they're hoping that, you know, six months is going to finish it because some kids finish the program in six months and that's the goal, right? But sometimes, well, there is benefit to practicing those changes over and over and over and over. So what would the old Naaman do is in your head because you did it so many times over weeks and weeks and weeks. And same thing for you, Liz. That's, those are hard habits to break and you got to do it time and time and time again. And, and Elena, I think that's a great point. And if you could kind of share with our listeners, I mean, how typical are these stories? Because I think you have parents right now that may be listening going, well, yeah, but that may have worked for them. But, you know, my child is unique. I mean, almost every parent that I talk to when we are setting up to to bring them to a program like yours, they're going, but you don't understand. My child is so different that something different is going to happen. And I think if you can share just a little bit about, I mean, how typical is this? You know, what, what is sort of the range? By typical, do you mean length of stay or just that changes happen? Yeah, the, the, the changes that are happening, because you know, the, like, like these two young people that you're hearing from afterwards where you get to hear the success stories, you get to hear, um, and, and I'm sure you also get to hear sometimes when things don't go quite right, but just to share that, that if this is something that's typical, uh, share that, and if the, if there are some other aspects that are maybe more typical, share that as well. Yeah, I think everybody who leaves Heritage leaves better. Um, how much better is up to debate, but stories like Liz's and Damon's are very common, and I find that happens in family or in children that have good family support and that spend enough time in the program to let those changes really truly happen. So it's really common. Just last um, month, I met with a girl up in Northern California who's starting classes, who you know was at Heritage about as long as these two and is really doing well and got her feet under her. And it's common to hear those sorts of stories. There are some that leave for whatever reason, maybe before their whole treatment was finished. And I still feel like they do better. They are better off and have better habits and changes than when they first entered Heritage. And I would like to ask Liz about that because she stays in touch with even a whole lot more girls than I do from her stay there. So what what do you think, Liz? Um, I do keep in touch and also Facebook makes it really easy to kind of see what everyone's up to. Um, But I also would just like to add that I I did come home and I was doing well for a while, but I might be successful now, but I wasn't always successful. You just have to be patient. Um, I slipped up uh, and actually I didn't I moved out of my house for about two years and didn't talk to my parents during this time and just thought, like, I'm 18, I'm so smart, my parents don't understand, like, I can't believe that I trusted them when I came home. Um, It took me a little bit of time to figure out that um, I was wrong, they were right, (laughs) Um, and I moved back home and was able to use my coping skills and all the things that I had learned at Heritage to kind of fix my relationship with them. Um, So... It's not like I just had a great transition home and things might happen, and I've seen it happen with a lot of other kids at Heritage where they come home and things don't go exactly as planned. But in the end, all of my friends are still friends with their families, and it's just brought them a lot closer. But I have seen kids who either left the program early um, because they convinced their parents, you know, they'd call and say, Mom, it's so awful here. I just can't do it. But... Okay, Heritage was awesome, so they were just trying to go home. But looking at them now, I wish that they had finished the program and gotten everything that I got from it because they've reached out and they're like, oh, Liz, you're doing so great. Like, how do you get to do all these cool things? And it's because I have a great relationship with my family, but unfortunately they um, left early and uh, maybe just went back to their old ways and didn't get that same experience. And you know what, Liz, that's a really great point. Um, A lot of adults even, you know, will leave treatment early um, and say to their their loved ones, oh, it's just, it's just awful here. They're in there. They make up different things that may be happening um, at the treatment center when it's not, or they will, you know, speak to the treatment staff and say, oh, I have to get back to a work thing, or my mother is, is dying. I need to get back. And it's really because, you know, during treatment, you are looking at yourself in the mirror. You're dealing with very difficult issues that you have never dealt with before. 
Um, and so a lot of people do try to escape, right? And do try to leave. Um, but you bring yourself with you when you leave. So then the same issues keep coming up. And I think the point you made is really important for parents to really hear and understand that when their child is calling them, telling them they have to leave and they're being treated terribly and different things are going on, that they really need to look into that and, and make sure that it isn't the uh, their child just trying to get out of treatment because they're really doing the child a disservice if they take them out. Because it's, it's you know, if they put them in treatment, there is a reason that they went through all that to get them to treatment. And if they take them out, they're going to be back to, to square one. Now, jo Joelle, I, I just think that's such a huge thing that you just brought up. And to, to add to that, uh, I got a call just not too long ago from a parent. I say not too long ago, probably six months, but it was from a parent that called and, and said, I'm really, really concerned. I just had a conversation with my child and um, and all of these things are going on. You know, you know, they're they're mistreating her and they're doing this. And, they, and she said, I, I, I know that you have taken lots of kids there. So, you know, can you please help me? Um, because if this is really going on, I need you to go up there and to take them out. And she was just frantic. And I said, I said, hold on for just a minute. I said, uh, you know, let's let's take a couple of breaths. Give me a moment. Let me pull the file. Uh, of your child and I pulled the file and I said now remember when we sat down and we did a history and part of the history was to you for you to tell us all of the things that were going on with your child and I said as I read this I said I noticed that you have down here that they've had a real problem with lying that they've been lying to you for you know for the last couple of years and I said so why is it that at this point in time you now have decided that they're telling the truth Right, exactly. And she had to stop for a moment, and she said, so you don't think that all those things are going on? And I said, I have never had that kind of feedback before in regards to this program that the child is at. So um, let's let's take a breath. So let's, let's think about this. And, and fortunately, I mean, so she kind of calmed down and got into it. So Joelle, I'm just saying that I'm so glad that you, you touched on that because, again, I think there's parents out there that, that – you know they're so you know that they love their child so much and they hear those things and all of a sudden they lose all common sense at that point and think that all of a sudden everything is great and they rush out and they want to play savior and and as I think you know you've pointed out and and it's you know it can be the worst thing that can happen mm -hmm. absolutely um, just actually a story about something recently that I heard. I had spoken to a mom that was thinking of sending her child to Heritage. Um, I went to coffee with her and kind of talked about it, and she expressed some concerns. Um, and I assured her that those weren't really things that were problems at Heritage. And so she sent her daughter there and eventually pulled her daughter out. And I saw we stayed friends on Facebook, and I saw that then her daughter ended up going to another facility once she was home for a little bit so I think her daughter is saying oh like it's just not right here it's not right like I understand I don't have kids but I can only imagine having someone that you love and care about so much and after making the decision to send them away it must be just heartbreaking to imagine them in a position where they are being mistreated but you really have to stay strong and it's what's best for the child like it, you could be selfish and ask for them um, to come home, but you really got to just like keep them there and have them finish. Well, I yeah, and, and I was going to say, and, and if they do need to talk to someone, you know, talk to their educational consultant that that made that recommendation. You know, that that may have been recommending, uh, you know, children to go there for the last you know fifteen or twenty years, and let them talk to that. You know, in other words, if you know, I would tell the parent, you know, talk to them. You know, have them give you some feedback that in many cases is going to uh, kind of calm them down and let them realize that they did make the right decision, uh, you know, when they made, when they chose to put the child in the program. Well, and for any parent considering treatment, I encourage you to do your research thoroughly so that once you choose a program, you commit. 
and stick to it and do these because it is hard and I'm sure Liz and Damon could tell us stories for days of things they saw and heard about kids trying to get themselves pulled early because you, you reach a point in treatment when it's really hard to look in that mirror and it's so much easier to blame everybody else and cause such drama and wreak havoc so you don't have to look at yourself and those hard things. So you can almost guarantee that it will happen at some point. So choose a program that you're comfortable with and that you can commit to because pulling out and starting over and then restarting six months later is just tragic. Right, which, which goes right back to what I was saying in regards to, to an ed consultant or a professional. You know, if, if your child has been in, in treatment, if you are working with a therapist that is familiar with different programs, you know, ask their opinion. You know, if, if you don't have somebody like that, you know, use an educational consultant that, that spends half their life traveling around looking at these programs and knowing the different nuances uh, of where they are a good fit for one type of child where they may not necessarily be a good fit for another. Exactly. Uh, you know, all treatment, it's not a uh, one size fits all. So you definitely have to, you know, instead of looking at the website, uh, because treatment centers can put anything on the website, it may or may not be happening there. Um, but speak to an alum slash graduate uh, like Liz took her time and met with with a mom if it, it would be um, m a lot of treatment centers have an alumni uh, group that you can call and get honest answers they're not being paid by the treatment center so you will get um, honest answers from from that person Damon do you know how your parents chose heritage well when I was at the treatment place before I told my parents I want to go to a boarding school well, maybe that was not the best idea. We had a lot of questions. How are you going to go to therapy? How are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? So then me and my therapist at my place before, we made this big old list. And it had all these places, and it had Heritage RTC. I asked, what does RTC stand for? Residential Treatment Center. No. Mm -mm, not going there. And I asked my parents, I'm like, really? I said I wanted a place with sports. They do have sports. I want football. They have flag football. Okay, you got me there. Some sort of football. So then my, there was a place in Colorado that I saw. I was like, oh, I've never been there. Maybe it snows there. My parents were like, it snows in Utah. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. It's like, okay. Well, unexpectedly, I got taken to Utah, and I stayed in a safe house in Lehigh. I was like, okay. This place is pretty chill. I like this. Got video games, and we got to do fun stuff there for like three days. Then my parents were like, yeah, we toured this place called Heritage. You're going there. I was like, uh-huh. Okay, <laughs> all right. And then I went there, and I saw the first staff. It was a maintenance staff named Skip. I was like, wow, Skip is a nice guy. I like this place. You know what? Let me try and make the best, and then... Eventually, I slipped up and then made the best at the very end. So I had fun. And that's the story. Well, I can add that while you were in that safe house, Damon, your parents were touring a few different programs there in Utah that were recommended to them by an educational consultant. So you helped make that list, and they at the same time were doing their own homework and making a list and, and touring the places so that they would find a good fit for you. And how did uh, school or... Let me ask, was, was school affected at all? Were your grades affected um, as far as going to Heritage and being taken out of your home school? How did that, how did that work for both of you? Um, I actually benefited a lot from going to Heritage because I'm not sure if it's still like this, but it was year-round school. So in the end, I was able to graduate a year early, and um, when I left, I was able to start community college early and kind of transition into that because that was going to be a little bit more of a challenge because of my past and um, it, it that was an awesome opportunity that I wouldn't have gotten if I had just stayed home and I also don't know if I would have graduated on time if I was at home um, academics were uh, definitely a struggle for me yeah I can add that heritage continues to be year-round and we're set up on a trimester system and so really in a 12-month period you can fit in three full semesters a lot of our students are doing credit recovery maybe for not going to school or failing everything in the past. And some are, like Liz, are working ahead so that they can just bypass the high school thing entirely and jump into community college and building a new life. 
Uh, for me, it actually benefited in a great way. When I was at home, uh, even 7th and 8th and ninth grade year, I kind of didn't do that well. 7th grade year, I failed PE. I don't know how that's possible, but it happened. 8th uh, grade, my grades were all right. Ninth grade, my grades were horrible. And when it came to Heritage, I was like, oh, crap. M more school? More school? I thought this place was going to be fun. So I looked at the schoolwork, and I was like, I know this. I know the schoolwork. This is fun. And then, especially being around the same kids, like there's like a hundred something kids on campus, being around the same kids every single day in every single class, knowing the teachers very well, they're knowing your background. It was like, wow, this school is really fun. So it became very entertaining to go to school because you go in class, you have fun, and it's like, it's like a modified way. Like, you have a lot of fun while doing it because I have classes now that are kind of like, oh man, this class is boring. The teacher's giving us a lecture. At Heritage, we do things to keep keep people intrigued in what's going on, keep people going, and especially just knowing that you have year-round school. I was behind in credits, and now I'm actually ahead in credits. Like I'm a semester ahead. I'm very happy about that. And also with uh, being ahead on credits, that helped me because I had a lot of anxiety of just even the idea of having to go home and back to my school. I attended a very small private school before Heritage, so going home to just the same four girls in my grade um, made me really afraid because I know that I had changed, but they hadn't changed, so I was afraid of that affecting how um, I was going to be behaving once I got home. So graduating early was exciting. I never had to see them again. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, and also, again, just it's um, it's really impressive to hear um, how you get that going back to the same environment wasn't going to be um, healthy for you. So you found a way to you found other alternatives for you so you could stay in your you know your long term goal and behavior and, and all of that. So that's really, that's great to hear. Um, so do you think the success of school, Elena, is that um, you have teachers that can teach to different learning differences? Definitely, and it helps that our class sizes are really small. Some classes may only have four or five students in them, and I think the very most they try to take is about 12. And so even if within, you know, let's say ninth grade English, you may have students on the autism spectrum or some with learning disabilities, and you may have a higher functioning intellectually student. And so when there's only seven or eight people in a class, the teacher can give different work and different attention to each student. Also, if needed, we can arrange tutors on campus. So some students, like I think Damon met with a math tutor <laughs> while you were there. And you can, in addition, get help outside of classes, plus from other peers on your home. I think also you had boys that would, and staff that would help you out with your math homework when you couldn't get a tutor, huh, Damon? Yeah, it was fun. Because you'd have those kids that were more of like, very, very advanced in learning. And I was in algebra too, but I'd be working with a kid that was in calculus. So I'd give him a math question, trying to like trick him, like, what's this? He'd have an answer in two seconds. So I'm trying to work out the problem, and he already has the answer written down for all of the problems I have. He has all of them written down already in like five seconds. So it's like, okay, do you know how you got this answer? No? And they explain it to you because you have 12 to, what was it, 14 kids on a home at most? Yep. And you have, well, when I first got there, you had two staff. They could all just attend to your needs, and you'd say that your math tutor was busy. You'd have those kids... And when those kids were there, say that one kid was helping you, that means there's 12 other students that are res responsible with 12, uh, two staff, my bad. And you guys are just working there. It's very quiet. You guys have a lot of fun. And they designate one hour a day called homework hour. And it's very beneficial to everybody because the kids that are kind of like screwing up in classes, it gives them an hour a day to work in and get all their work done, which is five hours in a week. So you're having a lot of fun doing it because say that you don't have homework, say that you have great grades, chill out, listen to your iPod, and just sleep. That's something that I like doing, so I got good grades, so I could do that. Let me add one more thing about the teachers that 
although class sizes are smaller, so like Damon said, they understand your background. They understand what's going on with the student. And when there are struggles with a certain student, they the teachers go out of their way to talk to the team, to talk to the therapist, even to engage parents and find out what's not working, what am I missing, what can we do differently. So it's a team approach. And when a student acts up in the classroom, the teachers right away get help and background information, and we come up with a plan to turn things around. So do you well, have someone on, on campus who uh, works with the college board in order to get accommodations if someone wanted to take the SAT or the ACT? Do you have someone to help with prep for those? For those yes, exams? there's not one set person, but on a case-by-case -case basis, like I've had students we had who have done online study courses for the ACT or SAT. We've had, a, had others where a tutor came in, like you know the first half of Saturday for a number of months. Um, so, yeah, case by case basis, we can definitely arrange for those things to happen. Um, just to All add right. to that. Yeah, I, I want to interject for just a moment that um, there's only about five minutes left. And uh, I want to ask a question, and, but I'm going to ask the question and then I want to share a story uh, as well. Um, I think one of the questions that, uh, that I think has a great effect, which is, for both Liz and Damon, where would you see yourself if you had not attended Heritage? So where would you see yourself now? And before you answer, I just want to share a story. Uh, there, was, there was a young girl who we transported that uh, went to a program and she went with me back some years ago. She went with me to Sacramento and she spoke before Congress and Senate. Uh, because she wanted to tell her story and one of the most powerful things that she said and the feedback that I got from some of the Congress people and senators that she spoke to was they asked that question and she said I would be either uh, on drugs pregnant in jail or dead if my parents had not sent me to this program and it stopped the room and this is a room that's used to hearing a lot of things when you're speaking before the Senate so I think that that it was such a powerful thing for people to hear that this came from someone who like you was ahead in their credits they started out way behind they had made a lot of mistakes she said not only did I graduate early but uh, I took um, I took some other classes and I was able to get into a major college uh, you know when I was only 16 because I was so far ahead in credits so anyway very bright girl uh, I kept in touch to the point that I know that she graduated from that major college uh, and went on to take on a very good job so uh, my question to you is where would you be had you not attended My honest opinion would be the same thing, probably dead or in jail, because at that point in my life, I really had no value for me. I had no value in anything in life. If that meant I had to take my own life or if I had to take somebody's life to try and get my point across, I would have to do that. But it really, I really don't like to focus on the what ifs. I focus on the here and now. And what I like to say is I'm a changed person now and I'm a great person. And I'd love, I'd love for people to look, instead of being in fear for their kids having to go to a treatment center, realize that if they go there and if they take in what they've learned their kids will love them more as parents than any kid will ever if they didn't because honestly my parents did what was right for me because if I have to go to the extent of doing something to myself taking myself off this earth or taking somebody else off that shows that I truly needed help and for my parents to take those steps I want parents to know that are listening that are going to tell their friends or any of that never be fearful because your kids will love you for doing what you did because it's helped me and it will help your kid and I promise you that. Wow. Liz? Um, I have no idea. I don't even want to start thinking about where I would be, but I know that it wouldn't have been good. Um, I was escalating and uh, just getting worse and worse. I'm sure I wouldn't have finished school or had a relationship with my parents. I'm sure once I turned 18, I would have thought, oh, I'm too good for this, I'm leaving, which, I mean, I, I did in the end, but I did realize what I was doing. Um, and, yeah, just I totally agree with what Damon said about um, sending your kids. I think it's a really, really great decision, and I know it's a big one, and it's something you need to think about, but it really will help if both of you put in effort. 
Yes, and and really what Liz said, both of you, meaning it is a family issue. Um, the reason your child is having uh, any sort of uh, problem isn't because uh, because the child is having problems without any family involvement. So the whole family has to work together uh, to make everyone healthy. It isn't just one identified patient, which is why it's so so wonderful that Heritage has the family sessions and, and they find a way to offer that over Skype or, or FaceTime. So look well, yeah. And, and Eleni, I was just going to say that um, is there any anything that either that any one of the three of you would like to share, but before you do that, I just I, I want to acknowledge all of you and thank you so much for sharing this information. Uh, it is it is one of the most powerful shows that we've done, uh, and it it takes a lot of courage, uh, especially for Liz and Damon, uh, to come on here and share your story. And I truly believe that you have done such a great service in helping so many other people. So again, I want to acknowledge you and thank you for coming on. I wish that we had more time. Um, so if there's any last words that you would like, I know that we've, you know, we've run out of time and uh, any time that any one of the three of you would like to come back, please just let us know. We would love to have you on. Wonderful. I would add really quick that there was an earlier program about heritage. I know there's so much we didn't say today. What is this program? How does it work? What, how do we do therapy? All of that stuff. So in July, for anybody interested, we did have a part one that was really about heritage and why it's in Utah and all those sorts of things. Yes, and I, I would like to thank you both for your honesty and openness and sharing your stories and for um, ma helping parents feel more comfortable if they are contemplating putting their child into treatment. I, th I know uh, as a parent, if I heard both of you, I would feel a lot more at ease with making that decision because it is a difficult decision. Liz, as you pointed out, even as the child. So thank you both so much for taking the time. You've really done a great, great service for being here. Um, great. And, just to, just and, and yeah. I was going to say, and, and Elena, th thank you for sharing that point. And for anybody that wants to pull up that show, go to AnswersForTheFamily.com. Uh, you can go to past shows, click on it. It will show... Um, you know, it'll show the exact show. You can listen to it uh, again. Uh, if you want to share this one, I for the parents, I highly recommend that you share this one with your young people. Uh, it'll be on the site uh, by you know later tonight. Uh, feel free to sit down with your family and share this so that everybody can see uh, the value that's out there and and for young people to hear it from someone that they can relate to that it's okay. And uh, just to alert you to the show next Monday, September 19th, guest Dr. Jerry Cartzanel, New York Times best-selling author, he'll be sharing with us his new book, Helping and Preventing Autism, the must-have book for families with children diagnosed with autism, ADD, ADHD, OCD, and other disorders. So thank you all for listening, and uh, again, you can hear the show on, on the website, and we will speak with you next Monday. Have all right, day. everybody, be good human beings. I'm saying goodbye from Romania. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for having me. Bye. Thank you. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza and Matt Polachek only on L.A. Talk Radio.